Well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting someone who has never worked on lemurs in his life. <clears throat> Unless you could consider lemur in a dish, because I have worked on lemur uh, cell cultures. But I've been interested in them for a very long time. In fact, I wrote a paper almost 20 years ago now uh, pointing out the potential use of mouse lemurs and other small primates in aging research. And very few people paid any attention to this paper, so basically uh, I wrote it again a few years ago. <laughs> and now it seems to have had some results, at least. No, I'm very pleased to see uh, what's developing. What I'd like to do today, though, is really advocate for a very specific use of, of mouse lemurs. And, and to get to that, I need to sort of inform you on, on why I think the most important biomedical research going on in the world is aging research, where we stand, and what we can stand to learn additionally from the use of small uh, research. So this is what's happened to life expectancy expectancy in the United States over the last uh, century, 116 years. And it's really quite remarkable if you think about it. What this suggests is that life expectancy has been increasing by six and a half hours a day for more than a century. That's, that's what science can do, and that's what science has done. And in fact, science has done that globally except for sub-Saharan Africa. Now, there's no evidence that this rate of increase in longevity is slowing down and in fact, it's gonna at least continue, I would suggest, in much of the world until we at least reach where Japan is right now, which is the longest live country in the world. Now, I have to point out, after listening to all the talks about Madagascar yesterday, I kind of was sensitized to the fact that, of course, in Madagascar, aging is not the huge problem that it is because this is where Madagascar stands today. But I'd like to point out that this is exactly where Japan stood at the end of World War II, and in that short time, it's gone from being one of the shortest live countries to the longest live country in the world, which just points out what can be done with sufficient attention. And so I'm hoping that uh, <clears throat> you know, something good will happen in Madagascar that accompanies the things that are happening uh, in the rest of the world. So that progress that I just pointed out uh, has a dark side, and the dark side is the fact that aging, the diseases and the conditions that it causes, is now without question the number one uh, global health problem. And like I say, it's not just in the developed world, it's throughout Asia, every place basically but sub-Saharan Africa. Now why do I say that? Well, what's the number one killer of people? in the United States and most of Europe, it's heart disease, right? And we all know what the risk factors are for heart disease. The NIH has spent a lot of money trying to understand these risk factors. But if you put all those risk factors in the context of aging, this is the impact of aging. And those other risk factors are still there, but they've all been completely dwarfed by it. So basically, heart disease kills is, is a disease of aging. Um, what's the number two killer? Well coming hard on the heels of heart disease these days is cancer. And we all know what the risk factors for cancer are, but again, if we place these in the context of aging, they're still there, but they can hardly be seen because they're so small. And, and, and I could go on and on and on, but basically every medical problem that's a major problem in the U.S., across Asia and Europe uh, are diseases of aging. Here's what Alzheimer's disease uh, is. If you counter aging. So it's not just the number one risk factor, it's the number one risk factor by orders of magnitude for almost all of the things that kill us these days. But it also contributes to degrading the quality of life as shown by this. People have hip replacement, knee replacement because they're in chronic insupportable pain. And these are the number of procedures that are done each year to try to alleviate some of the consequences of aging. So I'm building this up because I think unless we do something, we're facing a world with increases in all of these things, not to mention massive health care costs. This will basically break all of the banks of all of the developed countries and compromise our ability not only to do other things, but to do things with money, like conservation efforts, like 
uh, hurting other people. So I think this is where we should focus a lot of uh, attention in the biomedical community. And I have to say that's happening uh, as we speak. So I'd like to tell you where we stand now because I don't think people appreciate exactly how much progress we've made in understanding aging. Because if we can understand the underlying processes and treat them, we can push back all those problems, the fatal problems, the non-fatal problem, as a group. So these are the traditional animals that are used to study aging. And what we've learned from them is we've discovered hundreds of genes now uh, that are involved in aging. And if we tinker with them, if we either tune them down or turn them up, uh, we can get increased lifespan and quite often increased health because health is what we're after. It's not increased longevity, it's increased health and happiness, and that's really the goal of this research. Um, there's diets that have been shown to increase health. We just heard about uh, dietary restriction, which is only one of a number of diets that are uh, upcoming and seem to uh, have a great deal of promise. Uh, and there are medications, and there are medications that have remarkable effects, and I'll show you uh, one in, in, in a second here. Now, for something to be considered a biomedical model, it's important to note that it can't just be used in one laboratory or one place. It has to be used in multiple places across the world because that's the only way that science really progresses is when many people are working in a project and one result validates the other. And I present this intervention testing program as, as, a, as an example of it. This is a program in which uh, drugs are tested for their effects on mouse longevity, but it's done at three different places simultaneously and independently. And it's been a wildly successful program, and what it's done is it's revealed how much we really do understand the basic biology of aging. So far, that program has tested 19 drugs, here they are, and six of them have shown a positive effect on lifespan in at least one sex. You'll notice resveratrol uh, there, it, it, at least five trials, it's shown no effect on mouse lifespan uh, unless you feed a really high fat diet. But, um, so we have a lot of candidates. Now I've sort of highlighted one of those, rapamycin, because this is one uh, that you're gonna hear a lot about in the future. Before I get to rapamycin though, I'd like to go back to the the dietary restriction study that was just talked about because I think it's really important in what we learn from that. So McKay, as you saw, discovered this in the 1930s. We still don't understand how it works. Clearly people are not gonna be able to do it, but it could be a really useful tool if we can figure out how it does it and if we can pharmacologically mimic it somehow. But like I said, so far, uh, we, we, we don't have a clue as to how it works. And the interesting thing about it is it doesn't just uh, prolong life, it really prolongs performance. And this is just spontaneous locomotion of calorically restricted rats um, versus uh, sedentary rats. Now there's a couple of questions with all the behavioral biologists uh, in the audience. You probably, uh, some of you at least are thinking, what the hell are they running for? They're in a cage, they're not going anywhere. You know, is this really showing some sort of physical robustness? Well, the fact that they're still running when all the others are dead, I suggest, uh, means something. <laughs> now, there's a question, in my field, you know, people think there's only two mammals, there's mice and there are people. Uh, so the question becomes, well, why, why do we need any more models? Aren't, aren't, aren't mice and rats enough? And the answer is, if you look at the therapeutic success, of interventions to treat cancers or Alzheimer's disease, mice have been a remarkable disappointment. You can do remarkably sophisticated uh, research with them, but on the other hand, things don't translate well from mice to people. Less than one in 10, about one in 11 cancer therapies, and so far, complete strikeout for Alzheimer's therapy. Now, part of that might be because they're not real animals. Um, you can see on the left there uh, what they evolved from, you know, animals that were domesticated for shows, for putting on fancy fur shows, and after they got selected for all those bizarre fur traits, they were then inbred. And so now you have a mouse-like object that's very, very useful for research, but quite understandably may not tell you everything you want to know uh, about humans. 
So let me revisit the study that was just mentioned, the two studies. Now this is why I think it's so important to have multiple laboratories working on the same thing. As you just heard, the Wisconsin study, and these studies, by the way, started in the late 1980s. So it's taken them that long to get to this point. The Wisconsin study found uh, a significant effect, and the National Institute of Aging study found exactly the opposite. Now the thing is, that's not just an inconsistent result, but we actually learned a lot from that result. Because that result is quite understandable if you looked at the details of how they were done. And I won't go into that, but I'd be happy to talk to people about it. But they really pointed out that what we mean by dietary restriction, as it's done in rodents, is not at all clear when it comes to doing human studies. We, it's really not an easy translation. Uh, and again, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it later. Now, the lesson I think from that was they were studying the wrong primate, because that study raised some really interesting questions, but nobody's going to go back and do another 30-year study to follow it up. You know, I don't know how many postdoctoral careers went down the tubes over the 30 years of that study, but I would, I would suspect many. So this is what I think that the mouse lemur can be so useful for, is in helping translate these exciting new studies in mice to a new, more closely related species to humans to decide whether we want to go on with it. So let me just tell you about rapamycin. Rapamycin got its name because it was discovered in a soil bacterium on Easter Island, which is Rapa Nui in the local language. It's had this unbelievable results. When the first results were published in 2009, they made they made, they made serious headlines, they made serious headlines not just because it was the first drug to ever substantially extend life in mice, but they started giving the drug when the mice were the equivalent of 60 years old. They were the demographic equivalent of 60 years old. Now, I wasn't involved in that study, but my colleagues were, and what happened is they had trouble getting the rapamycin into food. And they'd set aside these mice to work on. And while they were trying to figure out how to get in the food, the mice were getting older and older and older. When they finally figured it out, they were this advanced age for a mouse. So they had to make a decision. Do we go ahead and do the experiment anyway, or do we breed up a whole new series of young mice? And if they'd asked me, I would have said, throw out the old mice, start using the young mice. But fortunately, they didn't listen to me. And they started it, and the mice, the female mice, from the time they started getting the drug, lived 38% longer than the control mice. You, you usually don't hear it presented like that. You usually hear it presented as what was the effect on total lifespan. But for three quarters of the lifespan, they weren't getting the drug, so that strikes me as crazy. So from the time they started getting the drug, 38% increase in a 28% in, uh, increase in males. Since then, Several other studies have looked at the effect of rapamycin initiated relatively late in life. These two studies here, the one on the left is, a, is survival curves of a study that was started when the mice were basically two years old, which is the median lifespan, so that's pretty much starting at 75 years old. And you can see there was a substantial impact on survival. The other one is the opposite of that. That's basically um, death rates. And again, it was started late in life, and you can see that the ones that were getting the rapamycin, only 20% of them had died at the end of the study, whereas 80% of the controls had died. Now, this would be remarkable enough if the only effect were on longevity. But I've pointed out before, longevity is not really the goal. What the goal really is, is, uh, is improved, enhanced, extended health. And here's a partial list of some of the other things that have been found uh, in the studies of rapamycin on mice. Alzheimer's disease, progeria, co normal cognitive aging, depression, anxiety, cancer. One of the things that was remarkable is it's a vaccine effect. And what they did was they actually gave rapamycin to some old mice. They waited a few weeks and then gave them a flu vaccine. And they compared the response to that of those mice to mice that didn't get a vaccine. Now, one of the things they don't tell you when you hear this um, public service announcements each year, go out and get your flu vaccine, is that the older you are, the less likely you are to get any protection from that flu vaccine. 
So trying to figure out how to make vaccines more effective for older people is, is a big part of vaccinology right now. So there was this big effect on mouse response. And two years ago was published this first study on human response where they did exactly the same mouse study, found exactly the same result. So within a few years, uh, everybody over 65 is likely to have a, a short dose of rapamycin before you get your flu shot, in which case your response will be as good as if you were in your 40s. So here's where I really think the mouse lemur can be uh, useful. I think that we really need a kind of a, a, mid, a midway model between mice and humans because we're finding all these promising candidates in mice. But in fact, nobody's going to allow you to give those drugs to healthy humans. You need to have better evidence than just that. And I think that the mouse lemur is a great way, a great intermediate to do this. Now, I want to focus on small primates generally, but of course, most all the small primates are small lemurs. So this really is about lemurs. Now, why a small one? Because small ones are shorter lives. And the shorter life something is, the more rapidly you can do it. Now, if you correct for body size, and I spent a lot of time doing this, I developed this thing a number of years ago called the longevity quotient, which is a certain calculation uh, uh, of how to standardize by body size. Uh, and basically, all it is is the ratio between the expected body size and the achieved body size. So by definition, the average longevity quotient is one. If it's greater than one, then things are living longer than the average mammal. If it's less than one, they're living shorter. Now, for the longest time in aging research, people thought that, that lemurs were short-lived primates. But that's because lemurs are small, right? If I actually uh, calculate longevity quotient among a span of, of, of uh, primates, you can see here in the black dots that the lemurs are right there with their, you know, primates generally are long lived. They live about 2.4 times as long as an average mammal. And lemurs are right there with any of them. So lemurs really are a very good representative uh, uh, primate. It's just that they're small because they're small, they're short lived, but at, and, in relative times, they're really a very nice model uh, of humans. So the, and there are all kinds of practical advantages of small animals. They're less expensive to maintain. They have an accelerated life history. You can rapidly expand a colony, as we just heard. They're producing 100 animals uh, a year. That's really quite remarkable. It's not mouse remarkable, but it's primate remarkable, for goodness sakes. And certainly, if the drugs that you're testing happen to have uh, be expensive, it saves a lot of money here. Now, let me reassure you, because I know there's a lot of people in this audience that hold lemur health near and dear to your heart. And one of the reasons I'm suggesting that the lemurs would be good is that these sorts of exams, if done very carefully, there's currently a rapamycin study being done in people's pet dogs. If it's done very carefully, it's not going to endanger their health because if there are any signs that it's endangering the health, the study would immediately be stopped. But potentially, it's going to enhance and extend the health of lemurs. So I think this is really a, a, a venue in which lemurs can mouse lemurs can play a very important role in not only for themselves, but also for the history of humans. So 10 years from now, we have another meeting like this. I'm hoping I can bring with me some longison. And longison would have been developed with the help of, 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 of mouse lemurs as a drug that enhances health at any age and, and extends health uh, at the end of life. And at that point, I'm hoping that uh, we will have uh, not only a uh, 100-year-old with a marathon record, but many 100-year-olds with a marathon record. That man on the right there is Fao Jia Singh, who, who ran a marathon, first marathon when he was 89, his last marathon when he was 101. He's now retired for now. He's, he's 105 now. Unless he makes a comeback, uh, he will hold that record until we get these uh, drugs going. So thank you for your attention.